Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday. I hope you're having a wonderful day. So today I'm going to be talking more about context-free grammars. So before anything, I wanted to kind of talk about one convention that makes things a little easier when writing out context-free grammars. Uh, then I'm going to be kind of motivating. I really want to give you an idea. What does context-free mean? Because it sort of it sounds like, okay, well, what does that mean? Like, what does context-free mean? I'm going to try to give you some motivating examples of what that means. Because when I talked about regular languages, I gave you a definition of what regular means. So I feel like I need to do something kind of similar to here. But this isn't going to be nearly as formal. I'll give you something more formal in a little bit. So first, I wanted to mention that there's a common convention that people use when writing out context-free grammars. So suppose I have a several set of production rules. So remember, I have production rules where this is the head of the production rule. It's a variable. Then I, or non-terminal. Some people like calling these non-terminals. Then I have the production symbol, which is an arrow. And then I have the body of the production rule, which I've just written here as alpha 1. And say if I have n of these production rules. So a way you can abbreviate all of this is using these vertical bars. And you can read this as, as alpha 1 or alpha 2 or alpha 3 all the way up to or alpha n. So this, this bar, it makes it easier to see it as like or, which is what how you use these production rules in the first place. You apply that one or this one or that one, right? So just as an example, here's the... Here's the context-free grammar we had last day. I just wrote it using these abbre this abbreviation. So just to make it a little easier for everybody, I'm going to, whenever I write ones, I'm going to try writing it like this so that it doesn't get confused with a bar. So these bars mean or, just like what you'd expect. It's quite logical. So this is just an example of how you can use these production rules and write it out like this. Say if you have multiple ones for the same variable. So you can think of it like each one of these belongs to the head of the production rule. And I'm just lumping them together. So I just collapse these all into one, but really they represent multiple options I can pick from. Which is nice and intuitive if you think about it. So I want to just give you just a simple example of just what exactly does context-free mean. So I like to call this the section on what's a context-free. <laughs> So let's, so let me just, uh, just kind of preface this. So very often context-free languages, at least if we're talking about variety of different things, whether it be formal languages or linguistics, uh, they're very natural for describing structures in language where sentences are built out of non-overlapping shorter, smaller pieces. And uh, I, one thing I want to stress is that uh, these, these pieces are recursively put together. So. So this is, when I'm referring to blocks, I'm talking recursively. You're, I'm going to give you an example of what I mean by this. This marker's not being friendly with B. It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> there we go. So here is an example of a little bit more complicated context-free grammar. So I'm just using the convention I just described. So I have these, and they're all going to represent kind of pieces to form a phrase. So I'm going to imagine the starting production. My start symbol here is S. Remember, I always have it at the top, at the top row here. I'm going to have two different rules. I'm going to have this one that says N, and then the other one's V. So S is going to represent a sentence, in quotation marks. N is going to be my, you can think of it as a noun. And then I'm going to have a whole bunch of these pieces I'm going to use to kind of form this together. So. So notice that I have a bunch of these rules, I can apply them, and I can form actually like a phrase out of these. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples of how I can do this. So I'm just going to use some of the notation that I used the other day. So imagine I start off with the, the start symbol. Then I'm going to apply, uh, let's, wait, let's, play, let's pick this rule. So I'm going to replace the S with NV. Then I'm going to replace the N. So I can pick from in my rule for N, I can either pick the CP or the C. I'm going to go with the C. And when I get the rule C here, 
Notice that I can replace this with AT. So I'm going to replace the C with an AT. So now it says ATV. Going for a ride. I, so now, once I'm at this stage, I can substitute each one of AT and V as those. So I can pick one from each one of those, AT and V. So I'm going to just skip some steps here. I'm just going to use this notation from last day. So this just simply means I'm going to have a multiple steps of derivations in between. I can write, for example, if I pick A to be A, like A, ah, I can say A, ah, and then I can put T, I can pick cat, a cat, and V, I'm going to say watches. So a cat watches. Is that kind of cool? So I can, so I, I'm building up phrases with this, this example here. And a lot of parsers, they often will build structures that are like this. So I, I promised you I was going to show you something that would be kind of like the structure you see with like a program. This is just a very tinker toy example of such a thing. When you're doing this with an actual program, it will look a lot more elaborate than this. Um, but let's do one more. So suppose I select the other rule here, this NVT. NVT, I'm going to replace. Uh, let's go replacing the N with a C again. Let's go C, V, T. And then I'm going to replace the C with, an, with the A, T. And then I have A, T, V, T. And just to make this a little easier so I don't cram it all over here, I'm just going to apply several derivations just to put each one of the... These, uh, it, at this stage, it's almost like doing... Have, have you ever done uh, before Mad Libs? It's where you have like a noun and then it tells you, oh, you have to put a verb in and so on. And right now I'm at that stage where I'm just going to fill in blanks at this stage from these right here. So I can, I'm going to write, uh, let's go the dog. So I'm going to pick A to be the, uh, T I'll pick dog, the dog. And then I can pick V, I'll pick likes. Likes, and let's see, I got another T. Let's go treats. The dog likes treats. So notice that there's many strings that could have gotten generated from just this stage here. In fact, there's some interesting things that don't even make any much sense when I can apply these rules, but these are a couple of examples. Now, I wanted to just illustrate what I mean by these blocks. So if I give you the dog likes treats, let me just write it here. The dog likes treats. So the overall string is generated by a whole bunch of rules, right? So I'm going to imagine like all of this. Actually, let me use a different color. I, I think it'll make things a little easier to see what I'm doing. So, so let me put some block notation here. So I'm just going to indicate these parts that get replaced. So notice that in my replacements here, the, I have some parts here that sort of just come out right away. So for example, when I picked NVT, notice that the V automatically I can substitute in directly with one of these words and T also gets substituted with one of these words. So notice that I, I substituted in for V and T, likes and treats. However, however, the dog part, the dog part was derived through multiple replacement rules, right? So through multiple derivations. So this dog part, so notice that the dog was separately derived from the the here, but notice that it was done through multiple replacements, right? Because I had to go N and then I had V. Sorry, I went N to C. And then from C, I get AT. This is AT right here after I replace those symbols. And notice how it nests. So do you see? So what I've described here, these are all those blocks I'm referring to here. These block-like structures that don't overlap with one another within their context. So notice that 
when I read dog and the, notice that dog could have been replaced with cat, the could have been replaced with a, and I could, a cat likes treats, right? Like, notice that those parts, they're, they're not related to the context of any of these other parts of the string, right? That's why we call it context free. So just to reiterate what I mean, context free means I can substitute based on rules, I'll put that in parentheses, based on rules without reference without reference to other symbols uh, without reference to other symbols uh, not part of that string and when I say that, I mean recursively, of course, of that string. Like this. So notice that it, it, the only parts that really matter, like when I, when I identify these blocks here, notice that they don't overlap with one another. They're actually nested within each other. So when I talk about the dog, for example, notice this the part has nothing to do with the dog part, right? I, I, if I change the, it doesn't change what dog is. It's a, they're belonging to different blocks. So I just want to give you some intuition with this. So just to make it really clear, so say if I had a starting production, say S, and I do a whole bunch of derivations, and I say if I had a string. Now this isn't related to this grammar. I just kind of want to just kind of draw you a quick little picture. So if I have A, B, C, A, 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 like this, where these are all variables, and those are the terminals, these lowercase letters. What context-free means that I can freely substitute this A as another symbol, like, say, X. And it has nothing to do with the rest of the string. That's what it means by context-free. It's not, it doesn't relay on any of the other part of the string. That's what it means by context-free, because, you know, if it was context it was sensitive to the context, which is another form of a language. Uh, we aren't going to talk so much about them, but they're related to a lot of this hierarchy of languages we're talking about. In those cases, you can actually take into account what's around that symbol or around that variable. Uh, these are so-called context-sensitive languages. But, but here we're just being kind of oblivious. <laughs> so does that help a little bit with the intuition of like why they call it context-free? I just wanted to give you just an idea about that. Okay, excellent, excellent. I thought it was kind of cute too. So that way you could see how you can use a context-free grammar to represent all sorts of different things, such as just simply like a little sentence generator like this. And in fact, uh, like I said, a lot of these languages, the formal aspect of them, uh, they, they are fundamental to how we describe sets of strings. But as we're going to go up, we're going to be able to express more powerfully languages. So a context-free grammar like this can describe basic structures of sentences or even just structures like programs. That's why context-free grammars are very much a thing that people get very interested in when they want to do things like compilers and have parsers. So I wanted to make one remark here. Just one remark. I have a question for you. Based on what we've seen last day of how I generate a string from a context-free grammar, can somebody tell me what do you think the language for this grammar is? Can somebody tell me what's the language of that grammar? So remember, I apply, so I, I start with the start symbol and then I replace it with one of our production, the body of the production rule, and I keep doing this. And I could, I could stop at any point, but the thing is I really care about once they're all the symbols are terminals. Because that's when I know I've generated a string. So look at this. So when I have the start symbol being P, I can either introduce a one with a zero after this P, 
and I can keep repeatedly applying this. And we saw this last day where it would just keep adding ones on one side and zeros on the other side. And then I could replace the P with, of course, a Q, and that would give me a two. But does anyone have any ideas of what language this, this context-free grammar actually represents? Any guesses? Let's see if I want to talk about the language of this grammar. So we know at some point there's a two in here, right? Of course, the P itself is a symbol that's going to represent a language in the context of the grammar, but I'm talking about the overall, the overall context-free grammar. What does the, what strings does it generate? So what does it describe? So I'll give you a hint. Somewhere in there, there's a two, right? Because eventually it's going to have to switch to this production rule to, so it could get this terminal here. So what should I write here and what should I write there? Any ideas? If I assume n is some non-negative integer. Yeah, so so let's see. So remember when I just when I just keep repeatedly applying this rule, so I'm hearing something good. So so should the zero go here or there? Mm, well, okay, let's just try seeing if we can generate some strings here. So for example, if I start off with just P, and then I could substitute it for a P10 like this, I can replace, so I can derive this again, uh, so that I get another P, but I can have 1100 zero, zero like this. I could keep doing this over and over again. Zero, 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 like this. Yes, so that would be what I would describe it as if I wanted to allow it to have as many as I like, indeed. But what, what would I use instead of star here if I'm describing it in terms of n here? So just replace the stars with the n's, right? Then otherwise you got it basically right on the button. That's awesome. So I got one to the n, two, zero to the n. And now one thing that's worth noting is this isn't a regular language. <laughs> you can prove with the pumping lemma that using that pumping lemma, you can show that this is actually not regular. This actually isn't a regular language. This is not regular. So I should, so you should see how quickly I'm able to design context-free grammars that are capable of generating strings from languages that are in fact not regular. Isn't that kind of neat? So, so that's, uh, that's how, uh, how easy it can be to get something that's a little bit more powerful with a context-free grammar. They're rather expressive. So now what I want to do is I want to switch over to give you actually the definition of a context-free grammar. So let's talk about what the definition of a context-free grammar is, because I've been kind of building up to this. So I just want to kind of put everything together. And then we're going to see how we can formally define the language of a context-free grammar. Then we'll do some examples designing context-free grammars. And if, depending on how much time we have, we'll see what some conundrums we can run into with context-free grammars. Okay, everybody? How's that sound? Are we doing good? Okay. Okay, excellent, excellent. So... Let's, uh, let's talk about what a context-free grammar is. So let me define it formally for you, seeing as I've been kind of building up to this. So a context-free grammar. So this is the, for this is the definition of a context-free grammar. I'm going to, at this point, I'm going to abbreviate anytime I say context-free grammar. If I write CFG, that's a context-free grammar. Saves me a lot of space. <laughs> so this is going to be a four-tuple. A four tuple G V T P S where where the following is the case. So V is a non empty, a non empty finite, finite set of variables.
Sometimes these are called non-terminals. I should mention that. This is in contrast to terminals. And you can think of each variable represents each variable represents a language. That's sort of the intuition behind the use of the variables. Each variable represents, some reason I'm writing representation, each represents a language. So each variable represents a language. So that's what V is. T is a finite set, a finite set of terminal symbols. Terminal symbols. Terminal symbols or terminals for short. So I'll often refer to them as terminals or terminals. These are symbols. These are symbols that form the strings in the language. So I must stress just two notes. Note that that V and T, so the set of all variables and the set of all terminals are disjoint. So meaning that there are no symbols they have in common with each other. That's what disjoint means. They were disjoint sets. And disjoints are disjoint and epsilon is not a terminal symbol. So epsilon is just going to be a feature of the context-free grammars. We'll see how we can use the epsilon in a moment. So just be aware that epsilon is not a terminal symbol. It's just, it's just the empty string, right? <laughs> That's all it is. It's just going to be something we can take advantage of. So P, P is a finite set, a finite set of production rules. Finite set of production rules where each rule, where each rule has a variable, each rule has a variable and, and a string S of zero or more, zero or more variables and or terminals. And or terminals. So in particular, in particular, let me write this a little bit more formally, seeing as we've, so IE to elaborate, S is going to belong to V union T star. Okay. And lastly, this is the easiest one. S is in the set of variables is the start symbol. Start symbol or variable, whatever you'd like to call it. I, I usually call it the start symbol but sometimes people like to call it the start, start variable, which technically it is a variable, so that's okay too. And that's the definition of a context-free grammar. Are we okay with this definition? So I've been trying to build up to this so that we, we have a general understanding of what I mean when I write these things. So are we all good with this definition? If we are, then I'm going to proceed to start doing some fun examples. Are we all good? Give me, oh, I see thumbs up. Okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, let's, let's start doing some examples, okay, everybody? So I wanna start off with something 
that is actually quite relevant to what we were doing actually before we started talking about context-free languages. So you might recall that in my examples for the pumping lemma, I talked about palindrome strings, so strings that are palindromes. So remember I told you, oh yeah, and all those strings with where you could read them from front to back or back to front, they read the same way. Well, I'm going to show you a context-free grammar that's capable of doing this, and it's going to look really simple. <laughs> so, so just let's do an example, just of me applying this definition. Consider context-free grammar, we'll call it GP, which is going to have as a variable, variable A. It's going to have terminal symbols zero and one. So you're going to see that the, sorry, the, yeah. So you're going to see that the terminals are going to play a very similar role to the input symbols. So like if you think about finite automaton or our regular expressions, the terminals play the role of the symbols that are going to get generated from the context-free grammar. And then I'm going to have, let's say, so I'm just going to write P to be the production rules. I'm going to list what P is below this. And my start symbol is going to be, I, I think I don't even need the square brackets. Let's just, let's just write A. Because there's only one of them. So the start symbol is going to be A. Where, where the production rules, the production rules P are as given below, are as given below. So let me describe this to you. So I'm going to give you production rule A. Now, sorry. When I, remember, when I say production rule A, I'm really talking about several different production rules. I'm just going to use the notation to make this very much more compact. It's going to be much, much simpler to read off. So I'm going to have a rule for, say, for example, because you remember a palindrome, it reads the same from front to back, right? So surely strings that look like, like this, that's a palindrome. It reads the same front the back as the same from back to front, right? Strings also that are just like a one, that surely has to be a palindrome. Zero is also a palindrome. The empty string surely is a palindrome. Even strings like zero, zero, one, zero, zero, that's most certainly a palindrome. So I'm gonna design a context-free grammar that generates strings such as this. In fact, it has to generate all of them. <laughs> so. The first one I really want to point my finger at is strings that look kind of like, like this and like this. Notice that I have, I have it where I want to have it every time I introduce a symbol that I have it so it's on the same, it's both appears on both sides of the middle of the string. So you think of the middle as either it's an odd length string, which in this case, the middle, there's clearly a middle symbol when it's even, the middle will be somewhere about between two symbols. So I'm going to create a rule for when I introduce a zero into the string, surely I need to make sure I have zeros on both sides, right? And this is going to be like the middle, the middle. I'm going to introduce another rule for if a one gets introduced. Same idea. And you told, and I remember I told you that one, zero, these are indeed palindromes. In fact, also when I don't give you any string, as in, uh, sorry, a, sorry, I should be more precise. I give you a string with no symbols in it, an empty string, that is also technically a palindrome as well. So notice that I could potentially put here another set of ones on both sides and then keep repeatedly applying that. Or I could do this with the zero as well. However, I might at some point want to actually put a middle symbol in here. Like if I apply this rule twice, notice I'll get two zeros on both sides, and I would like to be able to insert, say, a one right in the middle. 
So I'm going to introduce a production rule for that. So I'm going to have one. And then I'm going to have another production rule for zero, naturally. And I'm going to have another production rule for, which is going to introduce the empty string. Now, the empty string is just there as an option in case I have an even length palindrome. So, because remember, I told you that the middle might not necessarily have anything. Like, there is not really a middle symbol. It's just in between two symbols, right? So, notice that I could repeatedly apply these rules and I could generate any palindrome. So, let me just, just note something about this. Notice that, notice that whenever we apply rules for A, for A, we either obtain 0, 1, or epsilon. Each of these are indeed palindromes. Or inductively, or recursively, however you'd like to look at it, we add either a 0 or a 1 to both sides of A. So either going to put one, put zeros on both sides or ones on both sides. And do you see how I can get a palindrome doing that? So GP generates all binary strings that are palindromes. Now, you may recall from the notes in the examples I gave you, I showed you ways you can actually prove that this language is actually not regular. I showed you the, the case for when it's an odd length string, and there's a very easy way to change this up to make it so that it also works for even length strings. So this context-free grammar is capable of producing any palindrome out of binary symbols, like a zeros and ones. Is this kind of neat? So, so I didn't have to do a whole lot to get this, right? So this should really illustrate for you the expressiveness of context-free grammars. So let me just mention something about this. I just want to mention the language of a context-free grammar. So you might want to ask Dan, how do I know what the language of a context-free grammar is? I've said this verbally before, but I should really pin it down. If G is equal to V T P S is a context-free grammar, then, then the language of G, which I'm going to use the very similar notation I've been using before. L of G, L of G is the set, the set of terminal strings, set of terminal strings that have derivations derivations from the start symbol. From the start symbol. In particular, if you want the more formal way, let me do this for dramatic purposes. Ugh, let's get down here. So L of G is just going to be equal to W in T star, because remember, these are my terminal symbols, such that the start symbol, from the start symbol, I can derive the string W.
Very nice, very nice. So this is how everything fits together. So does everybody understand this definition of what I'm gonna say is a language of a context-free grammar? So remember, it's just, it's just a terminal string, so it has to consist of terminal symbols or terminals. And it has to be that I can derive it from the start symbol. Okay, so if we're good, are we all good with this? Am I getting you excited about context-free grammars? Because you could do all sorts of wacky things with context-free grammars. Okay, so let's, uh, let's proceed. Let's do some examples. So I'm gonna kind of go boom, boom, boom through a bunch of examples. Because I want you to see kind of what you can do with these. So I'm gonna start off first with some kind of more basic examples, things that, things that you would think of, oh yeah, I can design that with another thing like a finite automaton or something, but I want you to think about it. Just think about it in your own time, the exp how, if you could express what I'm going to do right here with a finite automaton, or you need something like a context-free grammar. I'll let you think about it. So let's, let's see here. So let's try. So let's do a series of examples here. So, so let's design a context-free grammar that has strings. So we're gonna generate strings with exactly, exactly one A and any number of Bs. Let's start off with something cute like this. This is something that isn't too tough to do, but I want to make sure we could do this with a context-free grammar. So I'm going to start off with the start symbol. So I'm going to write it as S. And now, remember, my goal is to make sure that there's at least one A in the string. So I'm, what I'm going to do, because I don't know where the A is going to be. I don't know where A is supposed to be in this string. So what I know is that surely, if I make a rule that allows me to substitute the terminals, terminal A, then most certainly, if I repeatedly apply a different rule that allows me to insert Bs in, it may occur before or after this variable here. So imagine I make a new, a new, set of production rules. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create one that allows me to generate as many Bs as I need. So if I need another B, what I could do is I could just, there's B, and then I'm going to allow it to call, a, you could think of it almost like I'm calling upon the rule again so I can use it again. So I can keep repeatedly making Bs, but I need some way to stop this process from happening. So I need some way to stop this from happening. So this is where epsilon becomes very helpful. So notice that if I apply for A here, I can replace this with the terminal A. And here for B, I, I want to make sure first I don't necessarily need a B before an A, but I want to allow it to happen. So you can almost think of this like I'm repeatedly applying B, like almost like you could think of it like if we're doing like some sort of loop where I could keep repeatedly applying B as many times as I like. That's what I use this rule for. When I want to stop it, I just apply the epsilon here. Does everybody see that? Isn't that kind of neat? So that's how we can use epsilon very often when we use it in a context-free grammar. So notice that this is just a, so this very simple context-free grammar is capable of generating strings of this form. So, a, so exactly one A and as many Bs as I like. So the other way you can know this is that, notice that I can't, I can't possibly finish this whole process without having to substitute this A in here. That's how I know I need, I need one A. And I never actually ever have any other rule that uses a symbol, uh, well, terminal A. But I can have as many Bs as I like. So for example, these Bs can just be epsilon, right? So let's do another example. 
So if you ever find yourself having any questions, please don't hesitate to stop me, okay? I'm just gonna go boom, 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 boom. And we're, we're gonna have some fun with this. So now I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna modify it slightly. So I'm gonna design a context-free grammar that generates at least one, at least one A and any number of Bs. So notice I'm just gonna change this from exactly one to at least one. So watch this, watch this. I'm gonna use the same idea I used before. So I wanna make sure that I can put A somewhere. Whoops, I don't want S, I want B. We need to use, I'm trying to just adapt the same idea I had before, right? I don't know where A is gonna go, but I need at least one of them. So what can I do? Oh. I can just do the exact same thing I did before. I put the A right there. The only thing I need to do is modify in one slight way. One slight way. So, of course, I wanna make sure I have that epsilon in place. Think of it like I can repeatedly apply Bs. But now, remember, I can have more As. So I'm allowed to just inject more As whenever I like, optionally. This, this A rule here is just so I can make sure I have exactly one at minimum. And then I can have more if I like. So of course, I can have it where I just put a B in. I, of course, I can have it where I have an A. And of course, I can of course just inject as many Bs as I like, or I can inject as many As as I like. So notice that by the same principle I'm using there, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm allowing myself to keep repeatedly applying this product, this set of productions. So if ever I wanna get more A's or B's, I can just call upon these two. And if ever I wanna stop this process, I can call upon these three here. Does everybody see that? So that's the only tweak I made. It's very like, once you see that, it's like, oh, that's kind of cute. So now this one's gonna kind of throw you through a loop for one moment and then hopefully I should be able to justify it for you. So let's design, let's design a context-free grammar that generates binary strings, binary strings with an equal number of zeros and ones. I must stress that this isn't the same as the earlier example where I had a bunch of zeros and then I had a bunch of ones after a two, for example. I don't know where the zeros and ones may occur. They may be like a bunch of alternating zeros and ones. I don't know. I don't know. So I'm just gonna, I wanna make sure I can generate binary strings with an equal number of zeros and ones. And now I'm gonna show you a neat little trick you can do. So what I can do is I'm going to try to take, I'm gonna try taking, imagining it all in one direction. So imagine I can inject a zero and a one, but I wanna make sure I introduce zeros and ones of equal proportions. So I wanna make sure every time I put in a one, there better be a zero. I wanna make sure I do this, but I wanna allow myself the option to make sure a one appears before the zero or the zero appears before the one. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create, create production rules for each one of these. So I'm going to have zero S one, and I'm gonna have one S zero. So that's what I just described one moment ago. So now this will allow me to put ones and zeros in whatever order I'd like. However, however, this is the big, the big interesting thing. Well, first I need something that's gonna stop this process from happening. So I'm gonna introduce the epsilon. So that'll allow me to stop this process of generating more and more ones and zeros outside that S. And then what do I wanna do? This is where you have to be very careful. 
because notice that I could have it where I have, okay, zero, and then I can produce a one, and then a zero, but I might actually miss some. This is because technically, I could give you the same string, but in reverse. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce something a little bit more careful here, and I'll let you think about this. I'm gonna introduce a rule that's SS. So this is gonna allow me, in case I ever have strings say in reverse of each other, so say one of these S's is producing one string in one direction, this will allow me to do the other way around. I'll let you think about that one. So, so that being said, I'm gonna do one quick thing. I just have one quick question for you. I'm gonna show you one more context for grammar and then we're gonna end things for today, okay? So I have a question for you. So here's a question. What language does this context-free grammar describe? So I'm going to give you a context-free grammar. It's rather a simple looking one. A1 and the rule A, so the production rules for A are zero A1 and, sorry, or epsilon. So does anybody have any ideas of what this Context-free grammar describes what language this describes. So think about it. I can apply, so I start off, I'm going to guarantee I'm gonna have a one right here after the production rule, whatever I apply for A. But after this, I'm allowed to have, I'm allowed to put in another zero and a one, and then I can apply A or I can use the epsilon rule here. Any ideas of what language this is? Somebody tell me what's the rule. Sorry, not the rule, what's the language? Somebody tell me what this, this language for this context-free grammar is. Let me just move over here. So you know it's gonna involve zeros and ones, that, I, that you should know. Okay, let's see. Zero to the n minus one. Yeah, the binary, the string always ends with a one. That's the first thing you should glare at. But I see it in the chat. It's a really good suggestion. I'm just gonna adjust it slightly for the way I've denoted what N is. Notice that always the number of ones is always one higher than the number of zeros. Isn't that kind of neat here? So notice that it's really just, cause I'm, I, I can have no zeros, right? So notice that I just simply have, I can have any number of zeros and I can have always make sure there's always one more than the number of zeros. And can somebody tell me, is this regular or is this not regular? I want you to think about it. We did actually use a string like this one actually in our, uh, in the past. Does anybody have any, any guess that this is regular or not? Take a guess. So just remember, it's not that, 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 it's almost like the one where I check if these have equal numbers, right? Let's, let, I'll, I'll just tell you. So, so this is in fact not a regular language. In fact, we used, you used a string kind of like this one, but not necessarily this one. Uh, actually, in a previous proof, when we did the pumping lemma, it's, it was just the other way around, where we had the n plus, we had a p plus one and a p on this side. We used a string like that, and we showed that it couldn't be pumped. Um, in this case, we have a whole language that consists of these. Uh, this is an example of one that isn't regular. An intuition for this, of course, if it was zero to the n, one to the n, you know that that also isn't regular either. So surely there's some way you could justify that this one isn't in using a very similar argument. Anyways, apologize for giving a couple minutes here over, but we're gonna stop right here. When we come back, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about parse trees and this notion of ambiguity that can happen with a grammar. And then we'll be talking about standard forms for context-free grammars. So if you ever heard of something called like Chomsky normal form, we'll be talking about that after that. So that being said, I wanna say thank you very much and you have a great weekend, everybody.
So remember, there is no class on Monday, so I won't be here on Monday. So, so keep an eye out for the assignment. Uh, the next assignment will come up probably on Tuesday. I originally had it scheduled for Monday, but it, I'm going to probably need that other day. So I'll say thank you very much, and I'll see you later.